and we've been holding a vision that that little street be transformed into a market well in not market square into just a square right in the heart of the town because every european town for example has a square in the middle of it because they were built in the days when people needed to be in connection in communication sharing products and produce for sure but also just sharing space sharing eye contact sharing awareness of each other and we're very quickly approaching a time we're probably long overdue when <laughs> that degree of connectedness is very very significant and very important and we need to build our infrastructure consciously to bring people into similar places so that their wellspring of compassion that human beings naturally have for one another as well as moments of irritation and profound frustration <laughs> <laughs> but that we can have fellow feeling for fellow human beings in whatever situation they are and it tends to take our rough edges off and helps us work together. Hi, this is Bruce Lipton, and you're listening to Green Planet FM. Kia ora, greetings, and welcome to Green Planet FM 104.6. I'm Tim Lynch, and I trust that you are doing well. I invite you to stay with me over the next hour as we discuss and find ways to take care of our unique and magnificent green planet Earth. I'm encouraging all people who are realising that for New Zealand to prepare itself to become far more robust, sustainable and resilient in our fast coming future, that we need to really commit to conscious action not only for our biosphere and all biota, but especially for the sake of our children and grandchildren too. If you have a broad interest in community connection, from organic gardening, permaculture, holistic health, and as many preventative and natural modalities, transition towns, food cooperatives, op shops, time banks and green dollars, homeschooling, men's sheds, women's cooperatives, community gardens, waste minimisation, farmers' markets, shelter and housing, grassroots activism and fun, this interview is for you. On the phone from Thames and the Coromandel, I have Mark Skelding, and Mark is a counsellor. He's been involved in communications and community projects throughout his life. He's also involved with environmental initiatives and transition towns. He is here to be able to share what's happening in the dynamic area of Coromandel and Thames because for the last 50 years there's been a lot of alternative movements, the organic movement, and Jeanette Fitzsimons, was able to capture the whole electorate for the Green Party and is the first Green political member to have actually captured a whole electorate. So, kia ora. Thank you, Mark, for wanting to share what is really happening at the grassroots level in your area. Kia ora, Tim, and kia ora, Tato, everyone. Well, probably the similar kind of thing that's happening in many places. The people are waking up. A lot of people are taking advantage of... The opportunities provided of living in this relatively warm, extremely moist part of the country. So there's a lot of people experimenting with different forms of lifestyle, different forms of building, cob houses, rammed earth, straw bale, lots of permaculture, permutations, you might say, people living off-grid and largely self-sufficiently, other people living semi-on-grid, but developing organic businesses, green businesses, lots of sole traders. That's sort of going on at one level. And at another level, we're grappling with how to connect up with other parts of the community that are more traditional, as you might say, that have come here to retire and live in peace by the sea and now are getting alarmed about sea level rise and climate change, eroding roads, as most people will remember in the last... 18 months we've had several massive storms come up the first of Thames and our coast road up to Coromandel has been taken out. Lots of flooding on the other coast in Fitianga and those areas as well. So there's a lot going on, Tim. <laughs> yes, it is. It's, it's amazing. Well, you know, the first step really is 
getting your land and then putting your dwelling on it. And you mentioned hay bale and rammed earth, and there's still timber available. Admittedly, it's exotic. It's, uh, we don't want to cut all our native down. So you're looking at people finding a way to get their habitat sorted out because I know that one of the big challenges for humanity is being able to afford to buy a house. So I'm interested in knowing that people are experimenting just putting up a structure so that they can get their shelter going so that then they can um, start to feel at home or build a home and a hearth. And I can see that too, there's a lot of, should we say, agriculture because once you've got your shelter, you have to have your food. And then on top of that, you've got good water as well. So can you just go over a few little things that may be happening with little groups coming together, how you share in whatever way you can? Well, these are such interesting times, aren't they? Uh, On the one hand, we have various sorts of intentional community, some of which are, I suppose, have a bit of a spiritual base, and I'm thinking of the Mahamudra community up just north of Coromandel Town, outside Colville Down here we've got Sudarshan Loka, which is uh, another Buddhist, different I'm not too up on the the different branches of Buddhism, but again, these are groups that are very integrated with the community, which are living communally, which are running various kinds of community-focused projects, whether it's teaching meditation or more practical things. I know that here in Thames, Sudarshan Loka runs a shop called the Lotus Realm, which is, is a combination of what back in the day would have been called a bit of a head shop, I guess, in terms of, you know, lots of icons and Buddhist books. But then there's also a wonderful music section. So there's that kind of community happening. Then there are people in various parts of the area who are buying land together and either bringing, bringing houses on or, as you say, building on it, building on the land tiny houses and so on so that's all the sort of rising of awareness but you know the other side of that you know we need to keep both sides in focus i think is here in thames we now have around 30 people who are actually homeless living in cars and sleeping out at the back of a community garden or whatever and some of these people have various addiction problems of one kind or another some of them are just maybe have you know other forms of distress going on in their lives but they don't have that sense of connectedness that sense of community that sense of purpose and access to the resources that you know many people do have who take off to buy a piece of land well you're talking half a million dollars yes or more Mm. you know so there's very much a different social strata different degrees of wealth resource and affluence involved in the choices that are being taken here so it's it's a fascinating time it is because thames once upon a time when it was the sort of gold mining capital of new zealand had about 86 different hotels scattered in the area and then they're supposed to have taken out over two billion dollars worth of gold and silver out of the coromandel area so it's had its money at one stage and then of course Thames now, I mean, I don't know, it's only got a few hotels. But so there's, it's been a boom and bust situation at one level, and, and now we've got to find ways to um, make sure that we don't have people on the streets. In a small community, you don't usually have that because they're more cohesive. You can understand in the large cities, but yeah, so what sort of outreach is there among the people? Is it we're struggling to survive in many cases, or when I say struggle, I don't like to use that word, but there are difficulties with just getting jobs or being able to be an entrepreneur, to be able to make money. And so we're all busy. I mean, to be perfectly frank, most of my fellow friends, you know, we're in the late 60s and into our 70s, we're actually tired because we've been doing this work since, well, since the 1960s, late 1960s, into the 70s, being activists in whatever level we can to see if we can get New Zealand to be a pioneer of a self-reliant, resilient, green, nuclear-free New Zealand. And it's been a major challenge all the time. So uh, you'd be fairly confident that the desires of the people there essentially want to be able to make it really successful? Um, Well, I think, you know, one of the things that uh, human beings tend to have in common with each other 
is a desire for things to be successful. It's after that, it's when it comes to defining what success looks like, that yeah. um, <laughs> people tend to get a bit out of kilter with each other. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of... But I think the thing is, is to go back, isn't it, to what we do have in common. And it's very hard to, to maintain a comfortable neoliberal perspective on success when you're confronted with half a dozen people sleeping in the car outside your house. And I think those of us who are activists need to gently keep those images with an attendant question to people in power and people who hold those more neoliberal views. Because most people ascribe to what you and I might call a neoliberal perspective without much awareness of it because it's so woven into our society. Yes. It's invisible. You know, it's like a goldfish probably has no concept of water. (laughs) Yes. So we need to gently bring that to their attention. And I have to say that that, um, around the Coromandel, and especially in Thames, which I know best, one of the great things about being a small community is, and, and I think this does apply across the whole nation relative to other countries, is we do have to join up. So our community centre, for example, has recently done a nice piece of research into getting some numbers and information about homelessness in the town and the wider community. And that's been a platform for enabling a conversation with one of the house building companies here, one of the home companies who are looking at how they can produce low cost, low budget housing. And then that is engendering a conversation with local authority and, and other landowning groups to to see how we might be able to get some affordable homes which may not necessarily even be purchased by the people who live in them but but will be rent affordable because one of the problems we have here is that as prices get higher and higher in Auckland it makes perfect sense for people in the city as they retire especially but even younger people with families to cash up their investment and come to a smaller centre and realise their asset. So it pushes up prices here and people are getting sort of squeezed out to market. So it's great that the community centre is doing that, gathering around it interested parties from business and other community groups like our Transition Town Group and so on to develop those conversations. Very good, because I passed through Thames last year and I think it was a Saturday morning and I managed to get inside your market that you had a town market where the farmers came in and various people with their products to sell and I ran into a number of people um, Rose Stewart and Jeanette Fitzsimons and a few others in the street so that was really nice to be able to just make contact and this is one of the other things that markets pull the people together that's where you can meet and catch up and strategize and just hang out for a wee while. Well, that's right, isn't it? And the the whole uh, history of Western democracy um, (laughs) arises out of the Greek marketplace, doesn't it? Yes. Agora back in the day and Athens and so on. So it's, you know, I think one of the things that in our Transition Town Group, we have deliberately worked closely with the local authority. Uh, We've very consciously targeted them for conversation, not in the spirit of you should be doing this, because most of the people, in my experience, don't really really respond very well being told what they should do um but just putting forward a vision and saying what do you think wouldn't it be great if do you know this is an opportunity so for example we've consistently been holding a vision that people who know thames may remember that there's a roundabout outside the shopping center and the street from the roundabout runs back to the yes. main pollen street of town. It runs past our civic building. And we've been holding a vision that that little street be transformed into a market, well, in not market square, into just a square right in the heart of the town because every European town, for example, has a square in the middle of it because they were built in the days when people needed to be in connection, in communication, sharing products and produce for sure but also just sharing space sharing eye contact sharing awareness of each other and we're very quickly approaching a time we probably long overdue when (laughs) that degree of connectedness is very very significant and very important we need to build our infrastructure consciously to bring people into similar places so that their wellspring of compassion 
that human beings naturally have for one another, as well as moments of irritation and profound frustration. <laughs> <laughs> but that we can have fellow feeling for fellow human beings in whatever situation they are, and it tends to take our rough edges off and helps us work together. Yeah, fantastic, yes. Because what I've done with over the last few years, I've interviewed people from Whangarei, very strong community up there, and then also Project Littleton. Uh, ah, Margaret, the lovely, wonderful Margaret Jeffries. That's right. With a bit of luck, I'm going to be seeing her next week. And I'll give her my love. Okay, good, yes, because what they are doing there in Littleton is just fantastic. She's doing real wonderful things, and then there's uh, Lawrence Boomert uh, in Golden Bay and Ted Howard and Nelson, and I'm wanting to go around the country because I know that Hawke's Bay, uh, Havelock North have also got... Now, I can hear a lot of water being drunk down here or something going on in the background, is that...? Oh, we're, we're all getting terribly drunk celebrating Margaret Jeffries and Project Littleton. Very good, OK. <laughs> I'm making a cup of tea. OK, that's good. Well, everybody can... Is it homegrown tea? I mean, oh, look, I'd love to say it was something deeply, deeply local and, and incredibly healthy, but I can assure you that my favourite tipple is, is a bit of good old gumboot. OK, good. Everybody now will hear that I'll go to TMC gumboot tea. Now, <laughs> we've also got... I've previously interviewed people as far as a hockey yanger and also down in Raglan, and I need to go back to these people. But as I said, that... and. Have a look north or Hastings, Napier. There's some very good things happening there. And I think maybe possibly even in Gisborne. So what I'm doing is I'm giving out all the different areas in New Zealand. And I know that Masterton's also got some very strong things happening around green dollars or time banks. Mm. And, yep. and so this is the key to that is that New Zealanders, when they start sharing, will realise that we will have a sort of a database here at greenplanetfm.com that they can go into and then they can listen to whatever's happening in a particular area and then make communication with these people or replicate what they're doing. And, and so this is one of the majors I want to be able to do, Mark, the fact that you're even looking at housing and cheaper housing because I know that Kitsit housing most probably will really come into its own in the future, they may be even made of composites, but they'll be dry and warm. And you might be able to actually just redo the inside a little bit more to make it a little bit more softer. And because once you've got a place to put your head at night and maybe know that you're safe there, you can start becoming a little bit more relaxed and creative. And, and so this is what... Well, it's Maslow, isn't it? You know, if you think about Maslow's yep. hierarchy of needs... <laughs> That's it. You kind of work up. You've, you've got to be able to make it through the night um, <laughs> and hold body and soul together and, and look after your family before you can pull your head above the parapet. So it's, uh, it's very much uh, attending to those essential needs that we have to do before we can get above the parapet. I think the interesting spin on Maslow... I guess, is that we're having to redefine what it means to be an individual these days because actually an individual doesn't really cut it. You know, there's um, one of the great founding fathers of psychology often used to say, there's never just a baby. There's always a baby and a mother at the very least. And there's never just an individual. There's an individual is always in a context and we are one another's context. So looking after myself requires me to pay attention to what's happening around me even if the only energy I've got is to make sure I've got that house over my head and those of us who are more fortunate we need to keep an eye out on those around us because we're not separate you know and you could put that into a sort of do goody kind of attitude but which I think is a perfectly valid place to put it but yes. also at another level altogether you know we either hang together or we hang alone Yes, because in today's paper, newspaper, which I don't usually read, but they're talking about the fact that if a child has got poor food, they're going to have poor mental health as well. And so this is the next level down from housing, there's food and drink. And as we all know, is that there's a, an epidemic. I interviewed Sue Kedgley some years ago when she was the Green MP, and she also happened to be the chair of the Parliamentary Health Committee. And so she was right above 
everybody from the National or Labour Party and all the other various other parties. And I asked her, I said, well, I didn't ask her, I, I said, there's a lot of people, particularly in their 50s and 60s and 70s, who are now taking hospital beds across New Zealand solely because they've made very poor food choices and drink choices and they're obese and they're suffering from diabetes too and they've got heart problems. They're going to crash the health system. And I said, do you know about this? And she said, oh, yeah, I know. I said, you know? And she said, yes. And I said, well, does the health department know? She said, oh, yes. And the government? Oh, yeah, they know too. And I said, okay, what are they going to do about it? And she said, they're going to do nothing. Yeah, that's right. And so what it is is that for people to realise across the country that you're not going to get the top of the, the system doing these changes. It's got to be at a grassroots level. And this is where you're sitting at the moment, Mark, with your, your communications out to all the different people in your area to use whatever they can to come together, share their needs, learn how to put their story across... And then if they can commit and organise, then we can see a better future, particularly for our children, because that's the name of the game. Well, I mean, of course that's right. I mean, it's entirely right. And I remember sitting on the plane in Wellington Airport, oh, God, 20 years ago probably, reading North and South. And it was one of those wonderful moments when you find yourself thinking, hmm, I'm not sure if this is the best thing to be reading, because the article was all about Wellington Airport safety. And it had this surprising paragraph in there. I can't actually remember the figures, but basically it was saying the dollar value of a human life, as it was uh, had been worked out by the New Zealand Safety Authority or the Airways Authority. And basically they were working out the likelihood of a 737 coming amiss on Wellington's runway and the cost of extending it. And that was having to be, you know, and you can, on one level, you can understand that. But I think, but, you know, going back to Sue's comment, um, everything gets distilled into this financial value, and we have a financial system that, that, that skews everything. The corollary here where we are is, you know, and many parts of the Coromandel habitat is very low-lying. Tairua, Fidianga, Thames, Coromandel Town, and so on. Many of these places are within a couple of metres of the mean sea level. And the changes that are underway in terms of sea level, and particularly result of storm surge, which is much quicker, uh, fast-acting, than sea level rise is that housing and property is going to become more marginal, which means it's going to lose value, which means that the local authority is going to lose rates, which means their ability to respond and provide service is going to be diminished. So there's this kind of financial trap that I'm sure isn't unique to here, whereby to a certain extent it's not in the interests of the local authority to engage too vociferously with the conversation yes. in case it collapses the value of land because they need the money to do what they do. <laughs> and so this is a time where some really intelligent, joined-up thinking needs to happen that isn't only at the grassroots but goes right the way up to Jacinda's office and it involves people like the Insurance Council and others. I should give a bit of a shout-out for Tim Grafton the CEO of the New Zealand Insurance Council. He's been very tireless these last years, going to communities and talking about climate change and what we need to be aware of. Initially, he was talking to business communities, um, but more and more often he's been called up by local communities and our transition town group brought him down here a month ago. And he was saying, look, you know, The thing is, it's in the interests of the insurance companies to keep selling you insurance because they do that because they're a business and they're obliged to do that. So if they think they can sell you insurance for another 10 years, they will. And they won't get into a conversation about when they're going to stop doing that, but they will do that too, eventually. 
So there needs to be a piece of, you know, nationwide conversation about how do we move from the one stuck phase into something that frees up the creativity, the passion and the resources of this country. Excellent statement. That's very, very true. I mean, again, once upon a time, we did actually have a, a country who might not have been the country. We used to have telethon on. Yeah, yeah. And the telethon went for, I don't know, it was 36 hours or 48 hours. And you had all the different people from arts and sports. And they were, we were all wanting to get money from people to donate into a big pool for the benefit of the people who are unfortunate in this country. And it actually was a very, very powerful medium to show how a country actually came together. It was fantastic. And th- but this was, you know, 25 or maybe 40 years ago. And what we need now is a new conversation about this. And in America, 50 years ago, they used to have town hall meetings where people used to come and talk to the mayor and there'd be different speakers from around the country come and share what their needs were. Well, all this has fallen away in the age of devices and particularly mobile phones, etc. We're not communicating in a small area and sharing and allowing our vibes to affect other people that you can go down you can give somebody a hug if you want to because they have said or expressed something special. So we're in a situation where we need to take this conversation further and I'm going to just jump this right in because there's Māori. I mean, Māori, this was their country once upon a time and they need to be brought into the conversation. I was down at Kaikura about oh, four or five years ago and I managed to go to the marae there and I went round and past the uh, Whare Nui and there was this fantastic garden. It was huge and it was just full of veggies of all sorts. And I looked at it and I just said, wow, somebody has really got their act together or a group of them. And there it was, all this plenty of kai, this food was there. And again, we need our localised leaders to find sort of, I say, come together in cells and groups of cells and start working together and showing some wonderful results so that then other people can come in and look and then replicating them, replicating them not only in the area but across the country. Well, it's interesting that you raise that and and I, I would take a tiny issue with one thing you said there, Tim, because I think you said it used to be that country. I think you'd find that if you, you know, and I think we, you know, I, I think it still is their country because they signed a treaty. And, and, I, and those cells that you describe are not at all dissimilar to how, that whole process of Fano, Hapu, Iwi, and so on. There are some very strong models in Moritanga that, to some extent, we don't need to reinvent. They're already here. And... You know, and, and I think there's a, there's a whole lot of conversation to be done. And, and many community groups uh, have a kind of um, a confused... I think we're all a bit confused, to be honest. <laughs> um, you know, there's a whole kind of... We've got to do right by, by Māori and by the treaty uh, and acknowledge our bicultural roots and so on. And, and how many community groups immediately uh, rent a Kamatua and... You know, that there's a sort of emptiness in that because we don't seem to know how to get our act together and have that conversation. It's a very important conversation that you're pointing to, and it's a, a hugely difficult one, actually. I mean, I would love to, um, I'd love to pretend that we were well underway with that here in Thames, and, and, um, and we're not, you know. Uh, there's, there's, uh, you mentioned the the wealth and affluence that came from the gold and that was of course um, discovered by um, uh, some of the Taipuri boys back in the 1880s who um, knew what the uh, Pākehā were looking for and went and dug up a couple of nuggets from a, a <laughs> creek and the rest of course is history but um, w- you know I think, I think you're speaking to a really important part of the um, the essential character and, and uh, what was the word you used for? The, the kind of vibe of the nation, 
which yes. is which we all you know I mean how many people uh, whether they're into rugby for example or not you know who how many people fail to to be moved by uh, a resounding haka and um, and many of us only ever see it on, on the screen as an event like that, but you know, more and more often um, it's happening in our public occasions. And um, a wonderful moment, actually, in the, I'll give a plug for my um, a friend of mine, David Jacobs, uh, set up a thing called The Outlook for Sunday, which is a young people's film challenge around the themes of sustainability. And uh, it's been running now for 10 or 12 years, uh, short films. Um, four minutes long made by people up to 24 years old and uh, wonderful stuff it's all available online if people want to look it up and uh, the outlook for someday are very happy for communities to access that material and to use those uh, uh, locally made some very 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 professionally made some less so depending on the age of the kids but some profound pieces of social story and sustainability story but um, I'm just reminded of the last time I was at their award ceremony, um, a school from the East Cape area, a Maori school, predominantly Maori school, uh, won several awards. And um, this just resounding haka that broke out in the Air Tier Centre in Auckland when, when they were announced and the kids came up all kind of like, oh, shucks, to get their award. <laughs> Um, I was great, you know, and, and it, it's things like that that, um, that that then breaks some ice. And the important thing about having broken ice is to keep the water open. Otherwise, it freezes up again. Yes. And, uh, and, and I think that's, that's the area where we seem to be faltering a bit. That's my experience. I'm sure other parts of the country have a very different experience. But it's certainly one of our challenges up here in Thames and the Coromandel. I'm speaking with Mark Skelding. He's a spokesperson or he's a spokesman for the transition everything. This is a profound new way of pulling the strings of community together. And he is in the Thames Coromandel area where for the last 50 years it's been a wellspring of many different ideas and, and subcultures and creativity and spirituality and getting along with each other. I think, again, it's a fact that tiredness. We're, we're either very busy <laughs> or recovering from being busy. And uh, two, that uh, just survival is so tough for people that we... I mean, I've been going to meetings for the last, I don't know, 50 years nearly and seen... When I was going to all these different types of meetings, a lot of them were around issues and uh, environmental. There was, of course, the Springbok tour in uh, 1981 and uh, of South Africa coming to New Zealand where there was a, a split the nation. And then finally we had the great big battle, the nuclear-free battle, and that went on for oh, many, many, many years to get nuclear-free New Zealand. And I'm finding in many ways that the numbers are dropping off at rallies and marches and the meetings. But I think maybe in a small town, it, it may be a little bit different because there's a close proximity. You don't have to drive a long way to come to a meeting. And it's always good to get out and meet other people. And, and so I just want to see this happen. But you also have to have people who are have taken a deep in-breath, who are still inside themselves and maybe have an understanding of why they're here in this lifetime and what they feel that they need to do or drawn what to do or called what to do. And we, you know, I'm always um, calling out for these people to step forward because as far as I'm concerned, Mark, and you will agree with this, this next 10, 15 years is pivotal for our whole biosphere. And, you know, we're calling out for us to be joined by people there who at heart really have a connection with not only their children but all children. And particularly, I mean, the 
the species of animals and the species of trees now that we have, you know, the Vicoli dieback and, and the Bay of Plenty is now called the Bay of Empties from the standpoint of fish. And so there's all these uh, contingencies pressing on us to say, I'm going to do something different. I'm actually going to make a connection with my neighbour. I'm going to find how we can do it. And I've been a neighbourhood support coordinator up here in Auckland. This is back in the 1980s. And it was really fulfilling. And that, in many ways, has fallen away. And they now call it Neighbourhood Watch as against Neighbourhood Support. So can you tell us a few little stories about some of the wonderful things that have happened that you've come across in your area that can lighten the load a little? (laughs) Well, let me see. I mean... You know, all kinds of things. And and I think, you know, I think one has to, and it can be difficult, can't it? But one has to preserve a sense of humor and and indeed joy in uh, in humanity with all our vagaries and self-interest. I remember a few years ago, and Jeanette actually was was, was very much part of it with our Transition Town group. We asked Jeanette to get involved and... um, Jeanette for Simons, and, and she was great um, yes. because of, she's so well-known, well-connected, and has such a fine mind. But this was in regard to um, the beginnings of our, our energy project, and, and through her connectivity, really, we worked with um, the manufacturers of Green Stuff, which is an insulation made out of recycled um, plastic um, milk bottles and the like. Um, and they had a, a, a sort of policy or a project at the time. I think they had a problem, actually, because I think they, had, they were committed to taking uh, vast numbers of um, milk bottles and things, and they had a storage issue. I'm partly making this up, but this was sort of reading between the lines, and if anybody from the company is listening, they'll probably put us right. But so in the, uh, in the summer, it was possible to get the company to involve themselves with the community in terms of community insulation projects and through through them and, and through that, this process we got uh, close to 300 of our old miners cottages and whatnot uh, insulated um, in the ceiling and under the floors Okay, um, and at no cost to the homeowner or the uh, tenant and tenants could um, you know obviously the, uh, the householder had to give their permission but um the, 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 they would get this uh, wonderful service. Um, and and, and this, in a way, this isn't actually what you were asking for with the inspirational story, but it's more about kind of the vagaries and joyousness of human nature because we got rung up one day by um, one of these uh, people who said, look, I'm, I'm, really, um, I'm really happy about the insulation, but I have just stopped one of the installers who was crawling out with a, um, a long piece of cowrie that I had stored under the house for a, a furniture project. And i just like you to know, you know. And, and it was kind of like, oh, you're right, well... <laughs> yes. You know, there's always a shadow. I think this is the thing. There's always... Um, there's always uh, a shadow, and I don't know what the backstory was for this uh, person um, who thought they might uh, make off with a rather fine piece of, of curry timber. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it's, it's stuff like that that, 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 is, um, that that is the warp and weft of being a human being. Yes. And, um, you know, and that's one of the joys. I mean, you know, that there, there are the stories about... Um, uh, I can think of someone who um, probably always thought of themselves as being a little bit um, on the social outside one way or another or awkward or not able to get involved or having nothing to offer. I mean, these are stories that a lot of people... You know, our society functions on disempowering us as individuals. Incredibly. Except, you know, except with our post card. <laughs> and... Um, uh, anyway, I'm thinking of this person, and, and they were persuaded. Um, well, they got involved with, with the community garden and found a place. You know, everybody needs a place. And they found this place, and then they got interested in a community garden, which didn't yet exist, but the idea of one not far from their home. And the only way they could see of pursuing that was to get involved with the transition town group 
so a they crossover. did. You know, so they did, and now that community garden is um, in the process of being. It's, it's you know, the, the first five or six beds have been constructed. We're having a bit of a break now, while, whilst it rains for several months. Um, but you know, there's a process there by whereby someone who felt they didn't know the way in found themselves involved, found a place, found a purpose, found a group of people who were, who could turn to them and say, well, you know a lot about growing stuff. What's your opinion? And they suddenly found they had a voice. And um, these, are the, these are the important things. Yes, they are. I think that's, uh, you know, you've hit a nail on the head there because up here in Auckland... The health department, the Manukau health department, there was obviously some really good people there realised that a lot of people in the region of South Auckland were suffering from food-related problems of uh, overconsumption and poor choices of food that they decided that they wanted to work with government to put in 50 cooperative gardens, local gardens, and they've done that, but I think now they're up to 70, and it's run by a guy called Richard Maines, and I actually applied for that job, and he got it, and he's a fantastic brother, and he's been able to do wonderful things to elevate it now to 70 different gardens across Auckland, and this is where all the different particularly the the people who come in from overseas who have now got an opportunity to, on their time off, to go and work together. And you could have so many different cultures and races working alongside each other and growing food, but then preparing up the recipes of different taste sensations, etc. And virtually every one of these gardens is organic. And so I would just like to call this out for anybody who's anywhere to see if they can approach particularly a church a lot of churches now have got a building that's not really been fully integrated into the community or utilized and there's area around that church where you say right we want to know if we can work some sort of deal where we can put a garden around the church well that's right that's right i mean um, you know the uh, wasn't um wasn't the good Lord laid to rest for three days in a garden? A big rock was there somewhere along the line too, yes. There was a rock too, yeah, and then, <laughs> you know, that got moved. A bit of, uh, but uh, I think that's right. And, um, the, the, you know, when you say that, it's heartening to hear about Richard's work. And I don't know Richard, but, uh, but good on you, Richard. It reminds me, my brother-in-law lives in Vancouver in British Columbia, in Canada there. And uh, that's a city, I think, about half as big again as Auckland in terms of numbers. They have a, a target of establishing 20,000 community gardens by 2020. 20,000? Yeah, yeah. The last time I was there, apparently they had over 4,000. Holy gee. Now, you better check that. But, you know, it, I think we have to start having unrealistically large ambition. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because the alternative is, is um, oh, it's not worth bothering, really, is it? You know, like... Um, um, we, we obviously need to keep our feet on the ground, but we need also to keep our, uh, our eyes on the prize. Well, that's really one way to get people breathing together. I mean, when you put food in the ground, Mark, and you would have experienced this, when, you, when you're out there, you're turning the soil over and you've got compost or you've got seaweed or you've got um, old cow manure and you're digging into the garden and and then you put your seeds in, particularly if you're lucky enough to have captured seeds from a, from a previous plant the, the last season, and see what breaks through the surface after three weeks or, or four weeks, and, and then start feeding this magnificent food, be it green, be it um, leaf, be it tomatoes, capsicums, or sweet corn, or whatever. When you know what you put into the ground... Then and you're eating it. You're eating the nourishment of your love that you've actually sort of manifested <laughs> in front of your eyes. And I think this is this is where it empowers you. And I think there's lots of areas across New Zealand, uh, particularly here in Auckland, that you can go past many, many vacant houses, not vacant houses, houses with no trees or no gardens and it just takes uh, some initiative to get that one happening because from there, from the garden, all things can happen. Yeah, now that's right. 
That's right. And I, and I um, you know, I mean, there are so many different ways. Not everyone's a gardener. Uh, some people are... Um, sparkies. Sp- yeah, some people are sparkies, exactly. You know, and then we can have a whole conversation about, uh, you know, the role of um, uh, alternative and renewable technologies. Um, and, and some people are um, accountants and bankers. And there's a whole place, as you mentioned before, about um, uh, Project Littleton to, um, to develop uh, community currencies. Um, and, and, I mean, that has been tried in a few places. And really, until, until such time as some brave local authority, in the first instance, is prepared to say... Okay, we'll we'll allow people to pay up to twenty percent of their rates in our local community currency. It's going to be difficult to get that one off the ground. But yes, the community currency keeps money circulating locally um, and and helps resource those who don't have access to other forms of finance. So it's very important. I had that down to my list to ask you because time banks and. Um, <laughs> Helen Dew down in... in yeah, Martin. lovely Helen. Yeah, Mar- All of these people, you know, all of these people, um, Helen, um, Margaret, um, Lawrence, and other people that you've mentioned, uh, from time to time have turned up at one of New Zealand's little-known treasures, uh, which is the Heart Politics Gatherings. Topo. Well, they used to be in Topo, and now they... Well, they, they, when Topo got a little expensive... Um, they went walk about for a couple of years. They were up the Kauranga Valley here at the back of Thames. Then for a while they were in Huia in uh, West Auckland. And now they seem to, or we seem to have um, settled, at least for the time being, out at Port Waikato, the mouth of the Waikato River. But this is an opportunity for people to, who might be listening Thank you. Um, to consider coming along. Um, check out, there's a website, of course, with a date. It's usually in the first week or so of January so it's through the school holiday times and um, it's a great opportunity to come and share time and share ideas share connection um, and shape a conversation there's a loose program but there's plenty of um, open space opportunities for people to make sure that they get the conversation they want and um, uh, it, it you know Helen Dew has been a a regular staunch tender of that. Um, other people in the past, have, you know, the whole thing was set up by the wonderful Vivian Hutchinson. Yes. Um, down in uh, Taranaki. Taranaki. There. Back Vivian. in 1981, I think it was, uh, 1982. First it, gathering, yes, it would have been, I think. Um, I was there. <laughs> you were there? I was there. Yeah. Good on you, Tim. That's great. <laughs> well, t- time you came back, we'd love to see you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, well... Heart politics is really important, and I'm going to jump across to Waiheke Island. Waiheke Island has, in many ways, it had the highest ratio of NGOs per population anywhere on the planet. This was about 10, 15 years ago, and there's lots of movement and lots of things happening in Waiheke, I mean, it, in many ways, it's a crucible for so many different holistic ideas or metaphysical and uh, ideas in relationship to you know, housing and energy and sustainability and organics. And so I just wanted to call out for Waiheke Island as well because New Zealanders have the capacity to actually come together. There's, they're gregarious enough and and we're egalitarian enough to want to be able to find it. Our neighbour's actually a good person. I mean, when I was the neighbourhood coordinator, uh, neighbourhood support coordinator in our little street in St Mary's Bay here in Auckland, I met some wonderful people, really lovely people, and I wouldn't have known them had I not been actually in that position of having to go and knock on the doors and meet these people. Yeah, exactly. No, there are, there are. And, um, you know, that, that fabric is, is under attack. That fabric is under attack by um, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the forces that would rather everybody had their own lawnmower than, than five people kind of shared a lawnmower. 
and, um, and, and the whole of that way of thinking designed cunningly to uh, give us more time and um, more leisure. Yes, yes. uh, (laughs) I'm not sure of the... um, Yeah, so so I do think, you know, I I do think that the... um, uh, Those values, um, obviously they're still there because they're part of our our culture and our heritage. Um, And and I think you see that in the, the, you know, in the turnout of young people on on things like the Anzac Parade and so on. Um, But... But again, it comes back to community groups um, and community action and the stories, how we tell the stories, because um, there need to be anchor points for that kind of aroha and community connectedness. We have to find ways of of letting people plant that and anchor in. And those anchor points have been somewhat eroded. And when I think about the community groups here, and I include our own transition town group and whatnot, uh, of which I'm part, um, you know, it's always a, a great celebration when somebody under 45 turns up. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> yes. I can talk and, to uh, that. Yeah, that's right. You know, people kind of want to, you know, make an extra cake. <laughs> and uh, uh, and you think, well, there's obviously something not quite gelling here in the stories that we're telling. We're not... Um, you know, and then, of course, you've got, you know, lovely Aaron Packard and people like him with 350.org and the work they're doing. So it's not that, um, it's not that young people don't care, but um, the, uh, their focus is, is uh, the connectedness, perhaps, is being provided by, uh, you know, the Bill McGibbons and others of this world who um, provide a global anchor point for our young people who are much more globalised than we were. Um, and and that's right. So, uh, you know, the old think global, act local um, is where us elderly community activists need to um, start kind of tying in and saying, well, okay, so how do we how do we support this? How do we connect up here? And and you know, again, you mentioned Margaret, and I have so much time for Margaret down there. Um, uh, yeah, she um, she shows some wonderful ways of doing that. And also of not worrying too much about it either. You know, at the end of the day, if you haven't got any 22-year-olds in the group, uh, there's no reason not to do something. <laughs> very, very true. We've, we've, we've got to deal with what we've got. Because I have a friend here at the radio station, and I said, look, you know, we need people to come through to the, um, the, the TPPA. We, we've got to find a way to rally and make sure that we don't get this um, jammed on us. And she says, oh, yes, well, but we're doing it on social media. And so you can lie in bed with your mobile phone and you send out a couple of postings to somebody and then you can lie over and go back to sleep again. Whereas this, regrettably, uh, <laughs> it may sound good at a, at a particular level because you, you think you've done your bit, but in actual fact we also have to actually show up and, and be present and be you know, feet on the ground and commit. And, you know, you've committed for a long time Mark, to wanting to to keep all your connections to all the people at many levels. You know, the holistic health is, is a very big field where people can work together and share without having to go to a doctor and take on massive amounts of pharmaceuticals when a, a good naturopath and a good acupuncturist and uh, a good body work can assist you and, of course, um, have somebody who can counsel you and, and draw out uh, what needs to be drawn out and put in place a new timeline of, of love and fulfilment and connection. Well, I think, yes, that's right. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're slowly getting our head around the fact that we're part of a system and we're slowly getting to understand that the system is interconnected and there's no part of it that you can um, treat as separate for very long. And... Um, uh, you know, in the field that I t- tend to earn my money in um, as a counsellor, and I also am a um, teacher of psychosynthesis, which is a very holistic um, psychology. Um, and people can do the uh, comparison between psychoanalysis, which means about breaking things apart, the analysis and synthesis is about putting it back together. But 
so much of our mental health issues, particularly, but all health, really, um, as you've pointed to about diet and so on, Tim, I think we can look at it more usefully as feedback from the larger system. And, um, you, you know, and, and the, the, the larger systems of which we are part are under threat and under stress and are indicating that. Naturally, we're part of that system, so we're going to experience that stress because we're part of the system and it's going to show up wherever we've already got a bruise or a weakness so um and so often people will turn up to their counselor or their psychotherapist or psychologist who do wonderful work but the mainstream vision is to treat that person as an individual and how rare is it that people visit their counselor or their therapist or their psychologist who, who has a conversation with them about um so how are you doing about climate change? Are, you know, you're showing up here with anxiety issues and you've talked a lot about, um, you know, how you got bullied at school. Um, and that's really important. But, um, you know, what do you think about uh, all the news about um, uh, climate change or uh, terrorism? These are frightening things. Um, how do you think that might be affecting your anxiety? Um, because if you're not feeling anxious about these things, you haven't, you haven't, you haven't, you haven't read the email. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, one of the awkward things, uh, as it is, Mark, we're running out of time. So, can you, in fifteen seconds, just allow us um, just a one little last minute uh, flurry, so that we can realise that we're all connected, we all share the same breath, and essentially, humanity can come together for the benefit of the whole and tomorrow's children. Uh, well. You mentioned breath and breathing, and that takes us directly to the trees, doesn't it, Tim? And what trees do, and all living plant material does, is generously provides oxygen for the whole system to keep ticking along. And I think we're on the cusp as human beings, uh, self-reflective creatures that we are, of starting potentially to realise that what we do is self-reflection on behalf of the whole and that we need to um, start to reconfigure a notion of ourselves as having a role in thinking and feeling and responding in ways that the palm tree that I can see out my window is unable to do for itself. Very good. Yes, yeah, we're all connected. As Chief Seattle said, whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. Mark, thank you so much for your time. This has been wonderful, and I greatly appreciate hearing your wisdom and your love and commitment to community. Ah, it's been great talking to you, Tim. Thanks for us battling through the various kind of communicative and technological issues we've had to, to be here. And all power to your own work and, and everyone listening to that. You know, we just have to believe in ourselves, don't we, and get on with it and keep talking to each other. That's it. Cheers again. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Tim. Bye now. Bye. Bye, everyone. That was Mark Skelding. Decide to network. Use every letter you write, every conversation you have, every meeting you attend, every email you send. And remember, even Facebook. To tweet and to express your fundamental beliefs and dreams. Affirm to others the vision of the world you want. Network through thought. Network through action. Network through love. Network through the spirit. You are the centre of a network. You are the centre of the world. You are a free, immensely powerful source of life and goodness. Affirm it. Spread it. Radiate it. Think day and night about it, and you will see a miracle happen. The greatness of your own life in a world of big powers, media and monopolies. But of 7.6 billion individuals, networking is the new freedom, the new democracy, a new transparency, and a new form of wholeness and happiness. This originated by Dr. Robert Muller, Chancellor of the World Peace University in Costa Rica, Central America. I invite you to be able to come to greenplanetfm.com where we have over 400 interviews in our database which you can readily download and listen to to be able to inspire yourself 
to become the change you want to see in the world and become involved in caring for your children and grandchildren's future, we are also on Facebook, on Green Planet FM and ourplanet.org. Please come and love us. This is Tim Lynch. And or Lisa Eyre. And Liz Gunn. In the spirit of Aroha, wishing you a wonderful week. We look forward to being with you next week. I say kia kaha and haere ra.